All right, is this better? Excellent. So we mentioned Ramanujan uh, came up with many amazing theorems, some of which I'm showing you here. Not only nobody in the West realized these theorems were true, they never even seen anything of this form with infinite sums and infinite fractions, continued fractions, and expressions for pi that involved four and five figure numbers exponentiated. It was pretty amazing. Um, and as we mentioned last time, the character of Matt Damon in Good Will Hunting is based on this guy, Ramanujan. In fact, uh, if you've ever seen the show called Numbers, how many have seen this? Uh, basically, a couple of mathematicians uh, use uh, algorithms to fight crime. What could be better than that, right? Uh, and so that show also has a character called Ramanujan. Uh, she's female, it's an amalgamation of uh, several other characters, but based also on this same guy, Ramanujan, pay, pays homage to him. Uh, contemporary of Ramanujan, uh, Frank Ramsey, also died young, uh, basically invented the theory of uh, Ramsey theory, what we call today Ramsey theory, combinatorics, uh, and a very, very interesting set of theorems. Uh, and uh, he was also Wittgenstein's PhD advisor. He influenced Johnny Van Neumann and Alonzo Church and many others. And basically, Ramsey theory, you probably know a little bit about it already, because the pigeonhole principle is a special case of Ramsey theory. Uh, so the pigeonhole principle, as you've seen before, sometimes called the box principle. If you have too many pigeons, not enough holes, some, some pigeons will have to double up. That's what this says, this pigeonhole principle. I know it sounds obvious, but you'll be amazed what kind of interesting theorems fall out of that observation in various guises. Uh, so again, uh, it says that there's no one-to-one -one function from a finite set to a smaller finite set. That's the formal definition, but usually easier to think about in terms of pigeons. But it generalizes. So if you have n objects and m boxes or containers, you can show that at least one container must hold at least n over m ceiling. Ceiling is the smallest integer bigger or equal to the quantity. Um, or, at the same time, at least one container must hold less than or equal to n over m floor. So that's a more general version of the pigeonhole principle. Let me show you an example of how it's used very incisively to prove something that otherwise will be horrendous to prove. Um, the problem is, show that in any group of six people, either you have three mutual friends or three mutual f strangers. So you have a circle of three that are all know each other, all don't know each other. So assume that no or don't know is a law of the exclusive middle is no other choice. So either a person knows another person or doesn't know another person and it's mutually, you know, it's a reflexive property. So how can you show that in any group of six people that either know or don't know each other respectively or all combinations, there's a, either a triangle of friends or a triangle of strangers, necessarily. It's unavoidable. How many have seen this problem before? Where have you seen it? Problem set one. OK, good. So you're looking there. That's nice. So we're about to prove this. And we'll prove it using the pigeonhole principle. And you'll see how easy that proof is once you apply that principle in the right way. But when you see a problem like that involving some parameter like 6 or any other number, always ask yourself, is it true for less? Is it true for more? Is it more obvious, less obvious when it's true, when it's false? What's so magic about 6? Why am I not saying 5 here? Because if there was five people, it wouldn't be true. Here's a group of five people where there's no monochromatic triangle. There's no triangle that's all blue or all red. And blue, we can assume it's strangers, red, friends. You can use whatever colors you want. So we're kind of encoding this problem as a graph where the people are nodes and the relationships are edges. So blue, again, means here strangers. Red means friends. So here's a K5 complete graph on five nodes, and it's colored in this way so that there's no monochromatic triangle. There's no triangle that's red, there's no triangle that's blue. So this is false for five, and that's why it's called six on this. Uh, it's calling out the number six in this problem, because it's not even true for five. But for six or more, it's always true. All right, so how would you prove something like this? Well, you can look at all possible graphs on six nodes color them all possible ways using blue and red, and make sure that you eliminate isomorphism so you don't have to do re recalculate the same graphs over and over again, modulo isomorphisms, 
Uh, it turns out there's about 78 different possible graphs if you exclude isomorphism. That by itself is not obvious at all. And that's, that by itself is hard to prove. And even if you list them all out, it's hard to see that there's no more graphs than these. You have to start looking at, you know, so this, this kind of proof is not very satisfying, even though you can easily show that there's exactly 78 non-isomorphic graphs on six nodes colored every, every which possible way. And for each one of those, none of these contain, uh, each one of these contains at least one blue triangle or one red triangle necessarily. And you can check it all out, but you won't be much the wiser. And certainly, you'll be much more tired after doing all this and not very much convinced that this is even true. Maybe you missed a case or two or five or who knows. Uh, so that's not a great proof. It's not elegant. It doesn't shed light on truth here, why this, why this theorem is true. So let's look at it more elegantly, more succinctly, like MacGyver would. So uh, here are the six people, right, represented as nodes. And then, without loss of generality, pick one of the people and look at all of their friends or strangers. But that one person that we pick without loss of generality has five other people that it's related or not related to in this in this group, in this group of six. So by the pigeonhole principle, here comes this principle that we promised. Three of these five people in this group are in the same category. Either three of them are friends or three of them are strangers. Why must it be at least three in the same category? Why can't he have only two friends and at most two friends and at most two strangers in this group of five? Very simple reason, but you've got to say something. Silence is not a proof. What do you say? Why must at least three of the five fall into the friend category or alternatively the stranger category, at least three or more? There's only two categories, and there's five things that got to fall into these two categories, friend or stranger. So by the pigeonhole principle, you're putting five pigeons in two holes. So at least one of the two holes must have at least five over two ceiling, which is three objects in it. How many get this? Because if one of the categories had two and the other had two, where would the fifth one go? It would be at most four. The fifth would be unaccounted for. So at least three of them must be either strangers, or at least three of them must be friends of this one person. So this is the one we focused on, and then three of the other guys must be either friends of his or alternatively strangers relative to him or her. So we're about halfway down with the, halfway down with the proof now. We're not quite there yet. But how many with me so far? OK, very simple first step, right? All right, now consider this edge here between these two people. If this, if this edge here is a blue edge, then we're done. We've proven what we need to prove. So assume that it's not a blue edge, otherwise we'd be done. Try to get away from proving what this says. And it's at least a, a, a blue triangle or at least a red triangle. So make this edge not blue but red. Okay, because if it was blue, we'd be done. That would be the triangle right there. Ta-da! PowerPoint animation. Very powerful stuff. So make that red. All right, next consider another edge, like this one here. If this was blue, then this blue triangle here would finish the job. The theorem would be proven. So we try to not to prove the theorem, to see if there's any way to not make the theorem true. So make this one red instead of blue. So now we'll make that red. All right, consider the third edge right there. And this third edge, again, if this was blue, then would have a monochromatic blue triangle right there, animated. So we're trying to avoid that, otherwise the theorem will be true. So make that red. And once you make that red, whoops, there is a red triangle. End of proof. In other words, we could not avoid the theorem being true, no matter how hard we tried. End of proof, end of argument. Short, succinct, pigeonhole principle wins the day. Any questions about that? How many get this argument? Good. Any questions about that? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so again, let's go to the whole proof. It's, it's so, so short. So you have six people. Focus on one of them, this one. Look at three of its friends or strangers of the same type. And how do we know that exists? Pigeonhole principle. Now, does it have to be these three? Could it be this one, this one, and this one? Of course. Then draw the lines to those. But we're drawing the line to an arbitrary set of three, and if you want, you can shuffle them around. It doesn't matter. So without loss of generality, we'll assume it's this one, and this one, and this one. If it wasn't, draw the lines to some other three. Your choice. Right? But we know it's got to be at least three, so that's the three we're focused on. Without loss of generality, W-L-O-G, without loss of generality. It's important that you argue without loss of generality. So it's not that it has to be that one and that one and that one, because if they're not labeled, it could be any three and might as well make it those three, otherwise shuffle them around. It doesn't matter. It's topological, it's not geometric. Where they are on the screen doesn't matter. It matters what they're connected to. Okay, so then once you have these three that are in the same category, none of these three can be the same color. Why? Because we're trying hard to avoid making the theorem true. Assume there's a way to not make it true. And if there was, this can't be blue, otherwise it would be true. So you're trying to avoid monochromatic triangles, triangles of the same color. So if this can't be blue, it better be red. So we make it red. This one can't be blue either, otherwise the theorem will automatically be true. There's the three mutual friends. So make that one red too. And that one, same reasoning. Can't be blue, because if it was blue, there's the blue monochromatic triangle. We're trying to avoid making that true, so make that red. And once all three are red, there's a red triangle. Either way, we got backed into a corner. We were either forced to find a blue triangle, and if we really, really, really didn't want to find the blue triangle, we were forced to find a red one instead. Either way, we have to find, we found a monochromatic triangle, no matter what these relationships are. See how much easier that argument is than saying, OK, there's 78 different possible graphs. And for each one of those, check for yourself that it has some red triangle or some blue triangle in each and every one. And then convince yourself that those are the only 78 different cases. There are no more. And on and on and on. And uh, you know, by the time you check everything, you're blue and red in the face. And you're not any smarter for it. You're just very exhausted. And the proof is not very convincing. Maybe you missed a case, you'll never know. You'll never be sure. Um, here, the truth of a theorem is unavoidable. It has to be true. Right? Any questions about that? A very powerful technique, all based on the pigeonhole principle. A very innocuous, innocent looking principle comes in very powerfully to save the day, to make a very long proof very short. Why are we even talking about the pigeonhole principle? Because it's a special case of Ramsey theory. We just started talking about Ramsey. So 6 is said to be the Ramsey number of 3, 3. In other words, now we're generalizing this principle. We're saying that in a group of 6 people, it must contain a 3 clique or another 3 clique of the other color. So you must either have a blue 3 clique or a red 3 clique in any group of 6 people. But now we're generalizing it to R33 being 6. So 6 is the smallest number for which a K3 must exist of one color or another. K3 meaning complete graph on three nodes. But there's a much more general theorem than that. And here's a slightly more general theorem. If you want R44, you need 18 people. In other words, if you have a group of 18 people, you can be guaranteed there's at least a group of four mutual friends or four mutual strangers. That's a little bit harder to prove because there's more going on, more moving parts and so on. But you can prove it with similar technique to this pigeonhole principle, basically slightly generalized and so on. And now you get the idea. So Ramsey's main theorem in his Ramsey theory is that for any pair of positive integers, B and R, there's an R sub BR. So there's a Ramsey number of B comma R. And that number always exists. It's an integer, and there's a minimum value. And it's not obvious at all that it's true for arbitrary pairs B and R, not just 3 and 3, or 4 and 4, or 5 comma 6, or whatever else uh, pairs you choose. So in some sense, Ramsey theory basically 
ferrets out order, seeks order among chaos. No matter how random you try to make a graph and interconnections between nodes or people, however you want to think about it, there's going to be structures that come out unavoidably. For example, K complete graphs on K, on, on K nodes, or whatever K. So if N is large enough, K could be large enough too. Of course, uh, these cliques are much smaller than the size of the graph. Exponentially larger and larger graphs are needed to get cliques of size 5 and 6 and 7. But that's OK. It's not about the, the size. It's about the notion that they're there unavoidably. No matter how random you try to be, there'll always be pieces of order that you cannot avoid. There's no such thing as complete randomness or complete chaos. So that's another intuitive way of thinking about what Ramsey theory is. And the pigeonhole principle, now you see why the pigeonhole principle is a special case. In the pigeonhole principle, there's a pair that must share the same bin. A complete graph on two nodes, which means it's just an edge. That's the pair of pigeons that must share a bin, or more of them, but at least two. And it goes on and on and on. Right? So here's some well-known values, Ramsey values. So for example, 3, 3, the smallest number that guarantees a, a triangle is 6 of either color. And we already said that if you have 18 people, you're guaranteed a clique of size 4. So 4 friends or 4 strangers are always unavoidable if you have at least 18 people. And if you want a, a clique of size 5 or an anti-clique of size 4, you need 25 people. If you want a clique of size 6 guaranteed, well, let's put it that way, uh, the, uh, a clique of size 5, uh, you need between 43 and 49 people. The real number is unknown to this day, even though it's, Ramsey came up with this 100 years ago. So these, these, these numbers here that are ranges, not exact numbers, are the best known upper and lower bounds on the true Ramsey number for this pair. You know, 7, 7, it's between 205 and 540. So you see the range keeps increasing and the uncertainty keeps increasing. Very few Ram Ramsey numbers are known exactly. And it gets worse and worse as you get higher and higher. So that's the thing we proved. Yeah, that's the thing we kind of mentioned without proof. But very, very few Ramsey numbers are actually known, even though the theorem says they all exist. And the theorem is true, and we know the proof of the theorem in general. So Paul Erdos uh, kind of incisively once, in, in somewhat jokingly, but there's a serious streak in this, said once, if an alien race of beings finally came to the Earth and said, you know, uh, demanded the value of R55, you know, which is this guy here, and said that if you don't give it to them the exact value, they'll destroy our planet, we should marshal all of our computers and all of our mathematicians and attempt to find the value. But, he said, if they ask for R66, which is this guy, um, we should try really, really hard to destroy them first, uh, because that will be completely hopeless. And even R55 will be very, very hard to find, the exact value. Even though we know it's between 43 and 49, provably. There's an upper bound proof and a lower bound proof that's separate. And, uh, so any questions about any of this? So I've shown you the tip of a very large iceberg called Ramsey theory. And that tip is called the pigeonhole principle. And of course, you can generalize it many other ways, not just to different numbers, but to different colors. So, so far, we just said blue and red. What if it was blue, red, and green? And you were looking for a clique of size R in blue, or size B in red, or size G in green, and these three numbers were all now different. So it turns out that if you have 17 nodes, R333 is 17, the Ramsey number of 3 3, 3 is 17. So now we generalize it to three different colors. For extra credit, prove that R333 3, 3, 3 is 17. And here's an example, kind of you know, hint for the proof. Uh, now, if this was that hard, I wouldn't be giving it to you as an extra credit. I don't, I, I'm not cruel. Right? I'm not play, I don't play gotcha with people. So the, you know, in, in one or two paragraphs, you should be able to prove R333 3, 3, 3 is equal to 17 for three colors, just like if we just proved couple slides ago that R33 is 6 for two colors. 
how many understand this statement or this question, what it's asking you to do? All right. About a third of you even understand the question. That's okay, I'll take that. It's a complicated premise, but that's okay. This is not going to be any exam. Yeah. Yeah, you start with 17 and you look for subgroups, you apply the pigeonhole principle a couple of different ways, and yeah, that's, that's basically, you generalize the, argu the argument from a couple of slides ago with the red blue, basically. Okay, so for extra credit, that's something. And of course, you can generalize it to hypergraphs. Hypergraphs are graphs where edges don't have to be a pair of nodes, they could be larger subsets of nodes. So you can have a hyper edge involving triples of nodes, not just pairs. Edges could be larger subsets of nodes of the graph. Those are hypergraphs. And there's variations of Ramsey theory for hypergraphs for infinite graphs, where graphs are no longer finite. They have an infinite number of nodes. And those have all sorts of applications. Uh, it's not just. But the bottom line is Ramsey theory basically says complete or to complete this order is impossible. Uh, order is impossible to avoid, no matter how hard you try. The farther you try to get away from order into this order, the more you run into some order on the other side. I mean, if intuitively, it kind of makes sense. You, if you think about it kind of intuitively. You know. All right. Any other questions about Ramsey theory, the pigeonhole principle? We just saw incredible application of it. Um, let me give you another application of it, just so, so you see how powerful this, this principle is. Remember, I gave you a problem, five points placed in a one by one unit square. No matter where you put them, there's a pair of points that are no worse than square root of two over two apart. How many remember that question? Good. How many solved that question? Any thoughts how you would solve it? And the fact that I'm bringing it up right now is a hint. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Take the square divided into four subsquares. Now you're putting down five points, and now you've got four subsquares. That means two points will fall into the same subsquare. Why? Two words. Pigeonhole principle. Now you have two points in one square. That's it. How far away can they go? Well, the, the diagonals, opposite of the diagonal. And it's a one by one square, so each subsquare. It's half by a half, right? So its diagonal is the square root of 2 over 2. And that's the answer. Any questions about that? How many get this proof? Really? How many understand the question? Good. You had me worried for a second. So five points in the unit square, how far away can the points be? And the answer is no farther than the square root of 2 over 2. Why? pigeonhole principle. Divide the square into two by two grid. Now you have four subsquares equal size. Now you have five points on four squares. That's a pigeonhole principle. Four holes, five pigeons. So that means two points, two pigeons must fall into the same hole, the same subsquare. And the farthest they can be away from each other is the opposite size of the square along the diagonal. The subsquare, the square that's half the side of the original. And diagonal of those subsquare is diagonal of the original over 2. Diagonal of the square is square root of 2 for a 1 by 1 square. So square root of 2 over 2 is diagonal of the small subsquare. That's about as far as two points can get away from each other. But now you're dealing with two points, not five. It's a much, much easier problem by the pigeonhole principle. So again, we saw two dramatic examples where the pigeonhole principle amazingly comes in and saves the day unexpectedly. Just think about it. The pigeonhole principle is a discrete principle. It's, it's about whole objects. There's no such thing as a quarter of a pigeon or pie pigeons. Pigeons either one or two or three. So the pigeonhole principle is a discrete principle. It's about e integer number of boxes and integer number of pigeons. These points in the unit square is a continuous problem. The points can be anywhere. There's an uncountable number of real coordinates where the points can be. Right? The point can be in 1 over e, comma 1 over pi, or whatever. So we're applying a discrete principle to a continuous problem. 
interestingly. So I'm just bringing it to your attention that the pigeonhole principle, even though it's a discrete principle about whole number of objects, integer number of objects, can be applied in a discrete continuous scenario. Not obvious, but we just did this. It works. So th that, that principle is so powerful that it can even be applied in a completely different domain where it's not even con discrete like pigeons and holes, but continuous over a large range. It can take on any ar arbitrary number of values, and it's still applicable, amazingly enough. Any, any other questions or thoughts about that? So do not underestimate the power of the force or the power of the pigeonhole principle. Very, very powerful Jedi mind trick there. Use it a lot. Always keep it in the tip of your mind. Uh, that and diagonalization and pigeonhole and, and uh, dovetailing. So when now we have several general tools already that get a lot of mileage out of over and over again. We'll, we'll see other examples where the pigeonhole principle comes in to save the day. But for now, keep it in your toolbox, ready to deploy. Keep it at the top of your toolbox. Any other thoughts, questions? All right. So that brings us to Hilbert, uh, one of the most influential, impactful mathematicians that ever lived, um, developed uh, so-called Hilbert's axioms, invariant theory, proof theory, metamathematics, a lot of different things are named after him. Most importantly, uh, he came up with a list of 23 open problems in the year 1900 in the Congress of Mathematics in Paris, France. He got up as a keynote speaker and said, here's what I think mathematics should work on for the next century, and he gave just a list of long list of 23 problems. He also, by the way, popularized David Cantor's transfinite arithmetic, um, infinite you know, quantities, uh, transfinite set theory, uh, all this business about the infinite hotel. Sometimes it's called Hilbert's hotel. He didn't invent it. Your Cantor did, but Hilbert made it popular on behalf of Cantor because he had a lot more street cred in the mathematics world. Cantor was, you know, being shunned at the time. He also contributed to relativity theory. In fact. He beat Albert Einstein to some of the general relativity field equations, um, but he gracefully stepped aside and let Einstein publish it first because Einstein pioneered the special relativity 10 years earlier in 1905. And, uh, but that's how good he was, that he kind of outraced Einstein on certain things on the mathematics side. Uh, some of his students were amazing in of their own right. Courant, Heck, Lasker, Weil, Ackerman, Zarmel. These are all famous impactful mathematicians themselves who all were understudies of this guy. And he also influenced Russell, Girdle, Church, and Turing. So this guy was Turing and Church and Russell's hero. And John von Neumann was his RA. So John von Neumann, one of the fathers of computer science, was Hilbert's lab assistant, basically, as, as, a, young, as a young student. Uh, and so here are some of the books about uh, Hilbert's contributions. And uh, Hilbert's discoveries and mathematical pioneering uh, works in, about invariant theory, Hilbert's spaces, and so on. He has a huge moon crater named after him, of course. Just to show you some more of his impact, here's some things in mathematics that are named after him. You know, there's Hilbert functions, Hilbert matrices, Hilbert spaces, Hilbert polynomials. Dozens and dozens of things bear his name, not just one or two or five. Hilbert curve is a fractal space filling curve that looks like this. You can generalize it to arbitrary dimensions. This is one of the many things that are named after him. So in the International Congress of Mathematics, the year 1900, he gets up and he gives the most enduring and famous set of open problems ever listed by anybody anywhere. Right? And some of them are still being worked on to this day. And now we're, what, over a century and a seventh later, and some of these problems are still not resolved, they're still being worked on. And it catalyzed many, many other problem lists, open problems, including DARPA's just a few years ago, and uh, there's prizes on some of these problems. In fact, some of these problems bear to this day a million dollar prize. The Riemann hypothesis is one of those problems that literally, if you solve that, you get a million bucks. Uh, not the easiest way to become a millionaire, but still, 
it shows you how impactful and important these problems were. And here are some, some, some quotes directly from his speech. This is what he said. You know, who of, a, who of us would not be glad to lift the veil behind which the future lies hidden? He's saying, I'm going to show you the future. He wasn't wrong about that. What particular goals will there be towards the leading mathematical spirits of coming generations will strive? And we know that every age has its own problems, which the following age either solves or casts aside as profitless and replaces them by new ones and so on. And he talked about the mathematical theory is not to be considered complete until you have made it so clear that you can explain it to the first person you meet on the street. What is clear and easily comprehended attracts the complicated repels. Basically, out comes razor right there. Uh, elegance and proof and arguments and so on. So we're going to go, I'm going to list for you each and every one of the problems, all 23. Now, some of them I'm just going to list for a few seconds and we'll move on, because they're more mathematical than uh, computer science. But a couple of them are so computer science related, we're going to harp on them and explain to you how they help pioneer all of theoretical computer science, which is what this course is about. So this is directly related to the course, this set of problems, but for uh, a few of them will kind of skim, skim right through them. But at least once in your life, you should see the list. It's so important. So the continuum hypothesis, problem number one. So this is your Cantor's problem, basically. So your Cantor basically showed that not all infinities are created equal. We already saw that with the infinite hotel and dovetailing through the rationals and showing by diagonalization that there are more real numbers than rational numbers or natural numbers. Diagonalization. How many remember diagonalization? Good, just checking. Thank you. Um, so the problem of the continuum hypothesis is the following. So Cantor showed that there are more real numbers than integers. So the infinity of the real numbers is bigger than that of the integers. So it's already two different infinities. He also showed separately that the power set of any set is bigger than the set itself. So there's, there's the power set of the reals is even bigger infinity than the reals, and so on. It gives you an infinite hierarchy. But back on the first two. So you got the integers, and you got the reals. The continuum hypothesis says, is there any infinity in between? Is there any infinity between the integers and the reals that's strictly bigger than the integers, but strictly smaller than the reals? Very sensible question. Right? If you ask that about you know, integers, is there any integer bigger than 1 and less than 2, you, know, you might, after a while, think, yeah, like 1 and a half. Or, you know, and that, that gives you a hint that there are numbers between the integers. And that's how we discovered the rational numbers and the fractions and then the reals and so on. So Cantor asked the same thing about infinities. Between the first two infinities, is there a third one? And for about a century, people try to prove or disprove it. Either show that there is an infinity between those two, strictly bigger than the first, strictly smaller than the second, in, in this dovetailing diagonalization sense, one-to-one -one correspondence existing or not existing sense, or show that there are none between the first two. That any infinity between the first two is either the first or the second, but there's nothing in between. Now, it turns out it was resolved in a very strange way. It turns out it's neither one. It's independent of the other axioms, this question. And remember what independence of the other axiom means. We already ran into this when we talked about the parallel postulate and Euclid's axioms of geometry, the parallel postulate being independent of the other axioms, and attempts to show that, it, that, that it's, it's, it's derivable or not derivable from the other axioms basically led to non-Euclidean geometries. And not only that, we later we discovered the entire universe is not Euclidean. That's what makes atomic weapons work and atomic power in general, E is equal to mc squared. The universe, it turns out, is not even Euclidean. So not only it wasn't this pie in the sky theoretical and, 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 and useful, it, it was actually more realistic than the other one that we thought we live in that Euclidean universe, which we don't. So it's not you, you know, Euclidean, Euclidean geometry is sort of the strange one, the unrealistic one, the one that's not associated with this reality. Who, who would have thought? So the, the continuum hypothesis, it turns out, has the same characterization. It's independent of the other axioms. What does that mean? You can either then assume the continuum hypothesis is true, or assume it's false, and either way, the system will not become inconsistent, assuming it wasn't inconsistent already. And that was shown in the early 60s by Cohen, who won a Fields Medal for this. And it's amazing that such a question can be independent of the axioms. 
I mean, you might think, well, either it exists or doesn't exist, this infinity, supposedly bigger than the integers but smaller than the reals. Well, it's neither one. You decide whether it exists or not. Make that a new axiom, if you wish, and your mathematics will still be consistent, assuming it was consistent before. And that's how it was resolved, this question. Any questions about that? So when, when some of these Hilbert questions are resolved, I'll this shows you, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how and which way it was resolved, and then we'll move, we'll move on. Some of them will harp very deeply on, as you'll see, because they're particularly relevant to the Chomsky hierarchy and computer science and Turing machines and so on. All right. Uh, prove that the axiom of, axioms of arithmetic are consistent. So uh, Gödel proved the consistency of a certain small version, you know, a small subset of algebra called piano arithmetic. And Gödel later showed that every formal axiomatic system is incomplete. We'll talk more about that when we talk about Gödel in particular. But what this means is that every formal axiomatic system has statements in it that are true but not provable within the system. Again, before Gödel, we had no idea that this is the case. So when Hilbert asked this question, prove that arithmetic is consistent, Gödel answered that some three decades later in another interesting, strange way. He said, not only we don't know if arithmetic is consistent or not, but every formal axiomatic system that's consistent has things in it that are true but not provable. Like, it, 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 it's basically a sophisticated form of Russell's paradox. Pinocchio saying, my nose will grow now, or me saying, I am, I am lying. Okay. Russell's paradox kind of disguised and generalized to a much more weird scenario where Gödel showed basically not just a flawed in arithmetic, but a flawed in every formal axiomatic system, no matter what. It is at least as strong as arithmetic, I have to add that little minor caveat. Uh, we had no idea. So this is a fundamental flaw in axiomatic reasoning. Axiomatic reasoning is what we've been engaged on for the last 3,000 years, since Euclid and before. It's still the best thing we got so far of how to reason about things, whether it's mathematics, engineering, physics, the universe, whatever. Uh, and their girdle basically shot a big torpedo into the very heart of axiomatic reasoning itself. He showed that Axiomatic reasoning is, is, in some sense, fatally flawed in the sense that it cannot prove all true theorems, no matter what. Uh, we used to think that truth and provability are the same thing. Everything that's true eventually is provable if we're smart enough to come up with a proof. Or at least a proof exists. Whether we can find it or not is a different story, but at least a proof exists for every true thing. Girdle should no. Every system has things that are true, but for which proofs do not exist for certain true things. Other true things we can prove, like 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. But other things, like Fermat's last theorem, we thought was one of those things. For 350 years it was open. We thought maybe it was one of those true things that are not provable. Turns out that there was a proof, and the proof was just very long. And that's probably why it wasn't found for three and a half centuries. But, but some things, not only the proof is not just very long, it's not just hard to find. The proof doesn't exist at all. Just like the number between a quarter and a third. An integer between a quarter and a third is not a matter of brain power to try to go and look for it. It ain't there to be found by anybody. So that's how this problem number two was uh, resolved, in, at least in part. And to this day, we don't know if, if our arithmetic, our, our math that we know and love, algebra and arithmetic, is consistent. You know, we don't know if it's, uh, we know it's not complete, assuming it is consistent because of Gödel's theorem, but we don't even know if it's consistent. The math that we use every day, we don't know if it really is consistent, if, if it cannot be used to prove a falsehood from. And, it, and if it can, math is going to be in trouble. On the other hand, we still bu build planes that fly and buildings that don't fall down and you know, iPhones that seem to work based on this math that we use every day, arithmetic and the algebra that's built on top of that, and calculus that's built on top of the algebra. So it's pretty useful. Whether it's consistent or not, we still don't know, amazingly enough. But it's useful to, of course, keep using it. Uh, all right, here's another problem, number three, that Hilbert gave. 
uh, given any, any two polyhedra of equal volume, is it always possible to cut the first, dissect it into pieces that can be reassembled into the second, assuming they have equal volume? So it's an interesting tessellation problem. So here's a tessellation of a square into pieces that can be reassembled into this equilateral triangle. So that's a nice example of a re-tessellation of one figure into the other, assuming they have the same area or volume to begin with. You can do a 3D version or a higher dimension version of this. So uh, a lot of interesting history of this problem. Um, some problems that he uh, mentioned are a little too vague to even definitely answer. Construct all metrics with lines of geodesics and so on. So, not, so you know, there's a few duds in there that were kind of dead ends. That's OK. The rest was so impactful, we forgive him for this. Uh, so more about the tessellation. Here are, here's a hinged tessellation. So not only it's retessellating a um, triangle into a square, but it's a hinged one. The tessellation is kind of hinging around itself. That's even more constrained tessellation than if you just allow to rearrange pieces willy-nilly. And here are pairs that are tessellated, retessellated as each other. So for example, if you take this pentagon and chop it up into these pieces like that, he could be reassembled it into this square. So a five gon became a four gon here of equal volume, or in this case, area volume is two dimensional for these examples. So here's a 12 gon into a six gon, a nine gon into a five gon, and so on and so on. It's really amazing that you could do this. It turns out somebody proved generally that you can take any figure and reassemble it into any other figure whatsoever as long as the two are arbitrary polygons. And they don't even have to be regular polygons. As long as the areas are the same, you can always convert one into a jigsaw puzzle and reassemble it into the other figure, no matter what. That is not obvious at all. In fact, you would guess that certain pairs of figures you cannot do this for. Their geometries are just too convoluted and complicated. It turns out you can always do this. And that's one of the solutions to the tessellation problem by Hilbert. And in fact, here's ones without regular, regular gons. So you can convert, I don't know, this, this plus-shaped thing to the star-shaped thing, and so on and so on. As long as the, volume, as the areas match, you can always do this. This is just some example. The general theorem is that you can do this for any pair, amazingly enough. Problem number six, axiomatize all of physics. What could be shorter statement than that? So that's very, very general statement. So out of that challenge of Hilbert to the world, number six, all of relativity theory sprouted up. Einstein took this. Remember, Hilbert came in the year 2000, in the year 1900 exactly. Einstein was still a teenager. He took this uh, challenge and came up with relativity theory. And 10 years later, he came up with general relativity. Other people took this challenge and came up with quantum mechanics, including uh, Johnny von Neumann and others. And later, we came up with a standard model, quantum gravity, string theory. So we're still working on this problem axiomatize all of physics. Uh, special relativity is a special case of this. Quantum mechanics, same thing. So you can imagine the impact this has had. You know, it's, uh, it's quite, quite amazing. Number seven is more mundane. Uh, the question is, is A raised to the B transcendental for arbitrary algebraic numbers A and B? Um, and we only have partial solutions to that to this day. So for example, we can, we can show that e to the pi and i to the i and 2 to the square root of 2 and so on are all transcendental. Transcendental means it's, it's irrational. But it, more than that, it means it's not, the root, it's not the roots of polynomial equations. So square root of 2 is irrational, sure enough. But it's also the root of x squared is equal to 2. Uh, but some numbers are irrational. And they're not the root of any polynomials whatsoever. That's what transcendental means. And some are open to this day. So for example, we don't know if pi to the e is transcendental or not, or 2 to the e, for that matter. We sure suspect it is. It's hard to imagine that pi to the e will be the root of some polynomial equation. We certainly don't have any examples of that. But we can't prove to the contrary either. Or even sim more simply, pi plus e. We don't know if pi plus e is transcendental. Now, we know that pi is transcendental. We know that e is transcendental. But we don't know whether pi plus e is transcendental, strangely enough. That's been open for a couple of centuries now. So it's very, very simple stated 
assertions that we really don't know the truth or falsity of to this day. And again, that, this, this all stems from problem number seven of Hilbert. He asked in general, could you determine whether a to the b is transcendental or not? Is it the solution of polynomial equations with integer coefficients? So a lot of very interesting um, problems. The Riemann hypothesis, that's a biggie. So the Riemann zeta function is relatively simple to state. That's it. That's the zeta function right here. Zeta of s is basically the infinite sum of all powers of 1 over n as n goes from 1 to infinity. Right? What can be simpler than that? It's a sum of powers. Now, s could be real. s could be complex, too. So it could be a complex function in a complex plane. So s doesn't have to be a real number. It could be a complex number more generally. And now you have a zeta function in the complex plane. And the question becomes, what are all the non-trivial roots of this function? And the hypothesis is that all the non-trivial roots have real number component equal to a half. That's just the conjecture. That all the zeros of the zeta function, the Riemann zeta function, have real component equal to a half. Nobody knows if that's true or not. There's no counterexamples. It's been open for a couple hundred years. Hilbert put it on this problem set as number eight. And to this day, it's open. And there's all sorts of, there's thousands of theorems that rely on the truth or not of the Riemann hypothesis. And a lot of theorems of the form, if the Riemann hypothesis is true, then the following is true. Or if the Riemann hypothesis is false, then the following is false, and so on. Um, so if you, you know, anybody could resolve this Riemann hypothesis, will automatically be resolving thousands of other theorems, including the runtimes of certain algorithms. Amazingly enough, the runtime of certain algorithms depends on the truth of the Riemann zeta function. You can try to imagine how that could happen. Right? If you have an algorithm, you don't know how fast it is. But if the Riemann zeta, if the Riemann hypothesis is true, it runs in polynomial time. Otherwise, it runs in exponential time. Same algorithm, no change. Uh, just to give you an example of what depends on this, you know, all sorts of prime number properties depend on this too, and the Riemann zeta function. So it's been open for over two and a half centuries now, and the Clay Institute of Mathematics has a million dollar bounty on this problem, literally a million dollars in cash, and for the solution of this problem. It's not easy to imagine that will be collected anytime soon. And by the way, it was numerically verified for the first 10 trillion zeros. So empirically, it's been verified for the first 10 trillion cases. That doesn't mean it's true in general, of course, but that's a lot of evidence that it's probably true in general, but it's not a proof. It's just uh, empirical evidence. Problem number nine about the law of reciprocity. It's not going to harp too much about. Uh, but the Goldbach conjecture was also part of number eight. He kind of lumped them together. Goldbach conjecture says that every even number can be written as a sum of two primes. So for example, eight is five plus three. Five is prime, three is prime. Together they give you eight. So he says that's true for every, every even number. Goldbach said that. Open to this day. Uh, it's been empirically verified for the first you know, trillions and trillions of values. In fact, here's the first thousand even numbers, each one represented as the sum of two primes in that many ways. So numbers around the range 1,000 can be represented not just once as the sum of two primes, but 30 or 40 or 50 times, different times, as the sum of two pr different primes. So it's true multiply, not just uniquely for values. Numbers in the range 1 million can be represented as a sum of two primes in thousands of different ways. So it's not just true, it's very true if you want to look at it this way. It's hard to imagine that there'll be some number out here where this will just drop to the floor to zero. It cannot be represented as a sum of two primes, and even once. That would be unbelievable. And people proved partial results. So for example, somebody showed in 73 that every sufficiently large even number can be written as either the sum of two primes or the sum of a prime and the product of two primes. Not quite the Goldbach conjecture, purely the sum of two primes, but almost. So that much we know is a theorem. 
Goldbach conjecture is still open. And other people showed even more recently that every number bigger than two, every even number can be written as a sum of at most six primes. So at least we bounded the number of primes having to be added up together to give you any even number. And of course, here's the evidence that two primes suffice for the first you know, few millions or billions or trillions of digits has been done empirically quite a bit. There's entire books written on this problem, and many other problems depend on this, and it's one of the holy grails of mathematics. Again, this goes back to Hilbert problem 8.2, the second part of his eighth problem. And here's some, just a top few dozen books on the Riemann hypothesis. Sometimes it's referred to as the greatest unsolved problem in all of mathematics. So there's many, many dozens, maybe hundreds of books on this very single problem. Amazingly enough, I'm just showing you a few. Any questions or comments about any of this? People have been spending lifetimes studying this one problem. Actually, they've been spending lifetimes studying all these problems that I'm showing you. Uh, anybody recognizes this guy, by the way? Richard Dawkins, anybody? How many heard of Richard Dawkins? Sometimes known as uh, Darwin's pit bull. But I digress. So here's the Clay Institute of Mathematics um, Millennium Prize website. And here are the seven problems for which they offer $1 million cash bounty for the solution of each of these. There's the Riemann hypothesis on this list. Um, by the way, here's the P is equal to NP question. It's on that list too. Whether polynomial time and non-polynomial time, uh, non-deterministic non polynomial time um, are equivalent in terms of computation power. Uh, we'll get to that. We'll talk about NP completeness. That's a whole section. Uh, we're going to go deep, much deeper into that. The Poincaré conjecture actually was solved. So just so you don't think these are all pie-in-the-sky unsolvable problems, some guy actually just a few years ago, about 10 years ago, solved the Poincaré conjecture, won the million dollars. His name was Perlman. How many heard of that? He won, he won the Fields Medal for it, too, which also carries a huge catch prize. He said he doesn't want the prize. And when he won the Fields Medal, he said, no, thank you. I didn't do it for the money. I didn't do it for the prize. When I asked him why he didn't want a million dollars uh, bounty on this, he said he lives in St. Petersburg, Russia. And there, if people realize that you have a million dollars to your name, your, your safety uh, is compromised. And uh, he's probably not wrong about that. But that's a strange way to decline a prize. I think he's the first person in history to decline the Fields Medal, which is a Nobel Prize equivalent in mathematics. Nobel Prizes, a bunch of people win that every year in different fields, physics, medicine, peace, literature. Uh, the Fields Medal is only offered once every four years. And you have to be under 40 to win it. So that's even rare, more rare than a Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize is like a dime a dozen these days, right? Not exactly, but compared to the Fields Medal there. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite amazing that he solved you know, a 200-year-old open problem, and even more amazing that he declined the huge prize and cash that came with it. I'm not sure which is more impressive. That's, that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, a few people in history have declined the Nobel Prize, actually. Uh, anybody know who declined the Nobel Prize? Not, not many people win it, and of those, very, very few say no thank you to the prize. Actually, you know, one of them just happened very recently, the last few months. Somebody won a Nobel Prize who was American. They won a Nobel Prize, didn't want it. Bob Dylan, yeah, strangely enough. I'm sure he had his reasons, although we're not sure what they are. But, uh, but other, others have won a Nobel Prize and declined also. Who else besides Bob Dylan? He was a singer, or is a singer. Actually, I once saw him live. Still pretty good. Who else won't decline a Nobel Prize over the years? Extra credit, you let me know. All right, problem number 10. So we're making good progress on this list. Uh, but this one is a biggie, so we're going to spend some time on this. So Hilbert said in the year 1900, find an algorithm that determines whether a Diophantine equation has any 
integer solutions of that. All the Fandini equation is is a polynomial, multivariable polynomial, like, like the Pythagorean theorem. X squared plus Y squared is Z squared. Right? Now, the Pythagorean theorem has a lot of solutions. Right? 3, 4, 5 is a solution, because 3 squared plus 4 squared, 9 plus 16, is 5 squared, 25. And there's many other solutions to the Pythagorean theorem. But if I said X cubed plus Y cubed is equal to Z cubed, that has no solutions in integers. Why? Three words. Fermat's last theorem. It's a special case of Fermat's last theorem. So the question in general that Hilbert said is, give me an algorithm. You tell me how to find out if a polynomial equation has integer solutions. What could be simpler than that? It turns out it's the hardest question you can ask. Right, so here's the, what we just said, Fermat's last theorem, no solutions. Pythagorean theorem, many solutions, and every, everywhere in between. So this problem has been worked on for decades and decades and decades. In fact, the Greeks worked on this already. So really, it's been worked on for millennia. The Greeks already knew about Pythagorean theorem. In fact, Pythagoras was an ancient Greek. And in general, they dabbled in polynomial equations, and they called it Daphantine after Daphantis. And many people have worked on this. And not until the early 70s was it finally nailed down this problem. And I'll show you I'll show you how, but first let me let me explain let me show you intuitively why this is such a hard problem. So if I say does there exist an integer solution to this equation x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed is equal to 29. What do you say to that? Is there a solution to this in integers x y and z? How many say yeah? How many say no? How many say yeah? Good, that's more people. Why? Why do you say there is a solution to this? Yeah, 3, 1, and 1. If it works, it works. So if you say x is equal to 3, y is 1, z is 1, then you know, 27 plus 1 plus 1 is 29. End of story. What if I slightly change it to 30? Instead of making the sum 29, I say 30. This one I won't bug you about because here's an answer. If you said x to this and y to this and z to this, and both of the last two are negative, uh, yeah, there is a solution. And in fact, you know, I, 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 I didn't even believe it myself until I plugged it into you know, either Mathematica or Google Calculator or whatever and actually cubed these three things, and the answer, sure enough, was 30, you know, amazingly enough. Now, what if I make that 33 instead of 30? It turns out nobody knows. All of humanity doesn't know the answer to that one. So look at how this progression ramped up in complexity from trivial, you found a solution instantly, to pretty horrendous. It would take probably weeks or months on a CPU, maybe years even, to cycle through all possible values to stumble onto this solution. But eventually, you'll find it if you search hard enough with enough CPUs and programming prowess, to this one, which is slight variation of the previous one, or the previous two, really, and that nobody knows. Nobody on Earth knows. If you put a trillion dollar prize on this, nobody could collect this. We just don't know. But we do know other things. For example, all integers could be represented as the sum of four squares. That much we know. It's a theorem by Lagrange. It's a couple centuries old. It's well known that every integer could be, or every positive integer, I should say, I should make this natural numbers, really, uh, it could be represented as the sum of at most four squares. Some of them could be zero, of course, so it's less than four. And on the other hand, we don't know other general things, whether every integer could be represented as the sum of three cubes, because if we knew this, this could be a corollary to it, right? Because this is a special case of this in general. And whether there exists an algorithm to determine whether any integer that's given is the sum of three cubes, even the existence of an algorithm in general is unknown, never mind what the algorithm is. We don't even know that it exists, such an algorithm. 
Okay, so back to Hilbert's tenth problem. Matyashevich showed much more generally than, than what Hilbert wanted to find out. Hilbert just says, give me an algorithm, that arbitrary polynomial, what are the integer solutions to it, if any. But Yashevich showed something much more dramatic. He showed that not only you can't do this for any particular polynomial, you can't do this in general. There's no algorithm that given a polynomial in general can always find out whether it has solutions or not. Uh, the algorithm itself in general doesn't exist. It's not just very long and complicated and convoluted and waiting to be discovered by some omniscient you know, entity one day. No, it doesn't exist. Uh, it basically showed something even more general that Turing computable functions are equivalent to polynomial equations in terms of what they can and cannot do, what they can compute or not compute, the sets that they can enumerate or delineate or define. So as an example, he gave, as a corollary for his more general result, he gave a polynomial, and here's the polynomial that he gave. It's 26 variables, a through z, and you know, the power is quite high because some terms are squared twice and so on. Um, this 26 degree polynomial coincides exactly with the positive, so the set of prime numbers, the set of prime numbers coincides exactly with the positive values of this polynomial down here that has 26 variables. And he didn't come up with this polynomial nearly willy. He came up with a general method of taking arbitrary computations and converting them into polynomials in a way that this property is preserved. So um, he also showed even more dramatically there's a universal polynomial that does the work of any other polynomial based on what parameter you give it as the first variable. Right? So it's like saying there's, there's a program that, that, that can emulate, simulate, and do the job of any other program based on what parameter you give this program, what input you give this program. Can anybody think of such a program that can do the job of any other program whatsoever? Based on what input you give it? You've all seen this before. One word. But what, what on the computer? Your Sudoku app doesn't do this. So well, what part of your computer specifically are we talking about? You're right, but let's nail it down. What program on your computer does this job, have this property that it can do the job of any other program based on what you feed it? Closer. Can your operating system play World of Warcraft? So what is the program that's so general on your computer that it can emulate any other program based on something that you tweak in its input. Kernel? What else? Can your kernel produce prime numbers? Can your kernel make a phone call? What? What does ISA stand for? Instruction set? OK, but, but that's not a program. It's a feature of the computer, right? I'm talking about a program, plain and simple. It's interesting. You'll kick yourself when you hear the answer, because it's so obvious. But I'm asking it in a general way, deliberately, so you see the connection to this, and you see the power of that capability, yeah. Compiler, yes. How many see that? The compiler can do the job of any other program. What, is, what, what do you have to tweak in the compiler's input to get it to do different things? What is that called? The program that you're compiling. So the string that you feed the compiler will direct it to do different things as the compiler interprets that string as source code. And by the way, that string doesn't have to be interpreted as source code. It could be Shakespeare's Hamlet. But Shakespeare's Hamlet is not a very interesting source code program. It's a very interesting play, but it's not a very interesting program. 
In fact, it's full of errors as a program. As a play, it's full of beauty, but it's, as a program, it's full of errors. It's all in the eye of the beholder, right? So a compiler is a general app, a general subroutine that can mimic any other program that you give it, including another compiler. How many get this? It's a universal program. It's a universal algorithm. Any compiler is, any you know, reasonable compiler is. What Metyashevitz did here, he showed that there's a universal polynomial, a compiler-like polynomial that can do the job of any other polynomial. In fact, it can do the job of any Turing machine based on this first parameter that you give it. That took 70 years to prove. A series of people did this work, which culminated with the work of Metyashevitz, and his entire book's written on this problem. And one of them is on the reading list. It's not required, but it's one of the optional ones. And, and that's how it went. Any, any questions about, about what this even means? I mean, that's, it's abstract. Right? I mean, you had trouble naming the compiler is the universal app on your computer. So I, I don't blame you if you, this is, this is even more abstract, because this is about polynomials. But this is a compiler version of the polynomials. It's the universal polynomial. So in, set, so in a sense, not only <clears throat> could you not have arbitrary algorithm to determine what arbitrary polynomials do, you can't have an arbitrary algorithm that determines what this particular compiler polynomial does, because it can do the job of any polynomial. So if, you know, if the halting problem is undecidable, certainly the halting problem for a compiler is undecidable because that can take on the behavior of any program that you feed it because it'll just emulate it. It'll compile it, execute it, and run it. You know, so the compiler can play World of Warcraft for you. It can make a phone call for you. It can run the computer for you. It can play tic-tac-toe with you or anything else that you instruct it to do as a string into its input that's called your program. So we'll talk more about that when we talk about universality. Very deep subject. Uh, so this is sort of on the mathematical side, based on Hil Hilbert's sense problem, this is how it got resolved. <coughs> so this notion of comp compilation occurs in polynomials too, in disguise. I mean, it's not obvious. You don't see a polynomial coming down the street saying, I'm a compiler, feed me programs, you know. No, you have to recognize that this is happening. It's very subtle. <coughs> okay. So we can talk about these polynomials and show that degree 4 suffices. So it's not even have to be, to be a very high degree polynomial. It's not about the degree. The minute you have degree 4, you've got universality. And the number of variables also could be remain small. It doesn't have to be 26 variables. It could be as little as 9 variables. The dimension is the number of variables of the polynomial. So it could be a very, very short compiler, in other words. And again, even in compilers, compiler doesn't have to be very long. It doesn't have to do all the full fancy stuff of a full-fledged compiler with all the options and trimmings. It could be a pretty basic compiler. It just goes through and you know, emulates your program one line at a time, and it's not very optimized. It just works. Right? It could be a bare-bones compiler. You can have a compiler that's only a few hundred lines long of, of, of code. It doesn't have to be tens of thousands of lines and highly optimized. I mean, useful compilers do all these bells and whistles, too. But they don't, they don't have to, is the point. You can have a very short compiler, very small polynomials. Right? So these are analogous to universal Turing machines, and uh, ones with bounded number of states and bounded alphabet. And there's a harsh trade-off between the degrees and the number of variables. And if you want the variables to go all the way down to 9, you can show that the degree 10 to the 45 suffices. Of course, it's not a tight bound. It could be a lot less than that, but this is an upper bound. And you know, very interesting work came out of this response to Hilbert's 10th tenth, tenth problem. Um, so, you know, when Hilbert asked, you know, uh, he didn't say, is there an algorithm? He said, give an algorithm that, given a polynomial equation, finds me whether it has integer solutions or not. The bottom line is that not only we can't find one, we shown, by we, I mean Matthias Shevitz and others, now it's common knowledge, we've shown that no such algorithm can possibly exist. Hilbert didn't realize that that could be a scenario. He said, 
He said, just give me one. You know, Hilbert, 1900, we assume that the minute you can state a problem, mathematically, unambiguously, clearly, without any fuzziness, there's got to be a solution. Wrong. It doesn't have to be a solution. It doesn't have to be an algorithm just because you hope that there is. Just because you can state a problem succinctly, unambiguously, it's mathematically precise, it doesn't mean there's an algorithm. And the halting problem has no algorithm, and we'll, we'll actually prove that when we get to Turing, not, not too far from now. And if you change that to rational solutions, not just integer solutions, wide open. We still don't know the resolution of this variant of the tenth problem, Hilbert's tenth problem, if you change integer to rationals. That's still open to this day. There's entire conferences today on Hilbert's tenth problem. Here's one from a few years ago where Matyashevitz, actually now older, actually showed up and gave you a couple of talks. And this is, again, the Clay Institute of Mathematics that put the million dollar prize on these other problems. Uh, so this is still very, very current. You know, there's still ongoing active research on Hilbert's tenth problem and its variations and variants and relations to other things. If you want to see a good video on Julia Robinson, who did some of this work upon which Matyashevitz built his monumental solution to Hilbert's tenth problem, there's a nice video by the Mathematical uh, Association of America. Uh, she was one of the pioneering female mathematicians of the 20th century. And at that time, there weren't too many female mathematicians, sadly. Even today, there's not that many proportionally. Uh, again, there's reasons for that. It's, it shouldn't be that way, but we're, we're fixing those trends a little bit too, too little, too late, but still, it's going in the right direction, at least. All right, um, problem number 11 about quadratic forms, um, Lacker Weber theorems. We won't harp too much on that. Um, just a few other problems here we'll just mention, or at least show you at least once, like this. Uh, some of them are resolved, some are still unresolved. Um, but um, enumerative calculus, uh, algebraic curves, so we're kind of breezing through some of the rest of it here. Uh, this one is particularly interesting. Uh, so again, we're going to slow down on number 18. Um, is there a space-filling non-regular polyhedron? So it's about tiling. So tilings have been going on for millennia, right? You look at ancient ruins and mosaics, and you see all sorts of interesting tilings. Um, and uh, sphere packing is related to that. How many spheres can touch a central sphere in three dimensions, all spheres being equal sized? So in two dimensions, how many pennies can touch one penny if you try to cram them in? What's the maximum number of pennies? And of course, the pennies can't overlap. So in the plane, how many pennies can touch one penny? Four? So I hear six. So I hear four, and I hear six. Five? OK, so now four, five, and six. So I'm talking about the maximum number. So cer certainly. Four can happen, right? Five can happen? Can six happen? How many say six can happen? Six pennies can touch one penny. How many say seven can happen? All right. Six is the maximum for the plane. Now, if these pennies are three dimensionals, they're called spheres. So, how many marbles can touch one marble? Or ball bearings or oranges of the same size, however you want to think about these spheres. How many say six oranges can touch one orange? At least. Well, if six pennies can touch one penny, certainly six oranges can touch one orange, right? You just, I mean, it's more than six. Yeah, it's more than six. How many? Most? Twelve. Do I hear twelve? Do I hear more? Fourteen? Think about, go to the market, you see a pile of oranges. How many oranges touch every orange in this pile at most? or can touch. It turns out 12 can happen, right? Six around in the plane, plus three on top and three on the bottom. Right? It looked like this. It turns out that 12 is a max, but for 300 years, nobody can prove that 12 is the max, amazingly enough, until very, very recently. So for 3D, the, 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 our, the sphere packing problem was unresolved up until very recently. It turns out that in dimension 24, you can have 196,560 hyperspheres touching 
a single hypersphere in dimension 24. And that number is exact. It's no more, no less. Now, how is it that in dimension 3, it was open for three centuries, and in dimension 24, the answer is simply this. Simply, in quotes, of course. Well, it turns out there's something called the Leech Lattice. It's a very special group theory uh, construct that uh, happens in dimension 24 and not in any other dimension. And no other dimension has the equivalent, the analog of a Leech Lattice. That's basically why. Uh, but all the other dimensions between 3 and 24 are still open to this day. It's a very, very tough problem. How many spheres can touch a single central sphere? And if you change the sizes of a sphere into smaller and larger spheres, or worse yet, not just spheres, but oblong shapes like M&Ms, all bets are off. It gets much, much worse, much more complicated. So that's uh, some stuff about Hilbert's 18th problem about space-filling objects and polyhedra and tiling. More about that next time.